Climb into the cockpit with pilot and Wing Square's Chief Legal Officer, Tim Perilla, as he invites legal leaders aboard to share advice that will help you navigate even the most turbulent times of in-house counsel work. We'll cover a range of topics from data privacy to legal team structure to public company transactions and beyond. You don't want to miss this series. Fasten your seatbelt and prepare for takeoff. You're listening to Cockpit Council. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Cockpit Council. My name is Tim. I'm the Chief Legal Officer at Link Squares, and with us, as always, is our producer, Alyssa Verzino. Today, our guest is Oscar Munoz. Oscar has held leadership positions at companies ranging from Coca-Cola to AT&T, but perhaps most notable was his role as CEO at United Airlines. Oscar also sits on a number of different boards and is a regular contributor on CNBC. Oscar's story is an incredible one, from having a heart attack just over a month into his role as CEO at United to dealing with the fallout from Flight 3411. Oscar's journey has seen unimaginable challenges and unparalleled successes. Oscar, it's a privilege to have you. Thanks for joining us. Oh, welcome. I sound like such a drama queen. <laughs> you mentioned all those things, but you know, indeed, uh, we had uh, we had some we had some stuff going on, certainly. And uh, thank you for having me. I uh, appreciate the conversation. And I've been hanging out with a lot of lawyers lately, so this is even uh, even more appropriate. And the fact that I've had a chance to to reflect on a lot of things and share whatever I can with all of you. So again, thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's get right into it. So we start out uh, we start out every show the same way. Uh, we love to ask our guests, "What is your pre-flight ritual?" <laughs> My pre-flight ritual. Yep. Well, uh, it's changed. When I was part of the company, I always boarded last. Now somebody did take my carry-on and put it in, so I wouldn't have to sort of worry about that. And then I just chatted with everyone. Uh, now I kind of take advantage of my emeritus status, and I will tend to board with my group, which is Global Services for United, for all of you that know, uh, just to get settled. Because I still ritually, uh, I got to spend all you got have to spend time with everyone and right. say hi. Uh, and then I, I go to the cockpit and say hi to the pilots. There's so many new folks coming on board. Um, what's weird now is I'm so used to always being recognized by the employees because obviously I was there. But we've had a 40% turnover in the uh, in the airline industry across the board, including United. So there's a right. lot of new people. So I, the ritual is to dis ascertain whether or not the flight attendants actually know who I am. For only reason, because I'm so used to going up to say, hey, how's it going? High five, hugs, right. you know, a selfie. Now I just check to see. And uh, it's, a, it's a weird new thing. Some are still reticent to say anything because they want to leave you alone, right. uh, which is a wonderful deferential thing that's not required for me. And some of them have zero idea who you are until somebody tells them. So so the ritual is one of uh, where's Waldo, so to speak. <laughs> so no one really recognize. Uh, but the customers uh, are always there, so I always have a good day. So it's it's still a thing when I show up and people see you um, where I, I'm not an anonymous, an anonymous traveler. Um, right. But again, it's, uh, it's a wonderful way to continue to sort of fly the, uh, the friendly skies flag. That's awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so let's no, let's no, we know what it is. I always have to, I always have to dress a little nicer because people know who you are. I would love, I would love to show up in sweatpants, t-shirt, a hat, and just hide, not shave. But unfortunately, there's always a picture involved somewhere. So yeah, exactly. It'd be nice to nice to be able to just get that neck pillow, the sunglasses, and the hat low. <laughs> Keep it incognito. Roll. Um, so let's uh, let's let's get into it a little bit here. So um, let's talk just a little bit about your career path. You're a finance guy coming up, right? Exactly. Um, tell yeah, just tell us a little bit about your career. Oh. What brought <laughs> you to a, United? And uh, so that was a, I didn't realize that was a question. No, no, that's <laughs> or, right. or a question to look like, so, uh, You know, you let people like us talk, and we can talk forever. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I did. I was in, 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 a lot of us went through this, and all of you appreciate it. Uh, when I went to undergrad, uh, my placement uh, scores and my AP test took me down more of a science path. So I was going to be a doctor. So I was pre-med for two full years, uh, spent a summer at uh, USC uh, County Medical in L.A., which is a, a hospital center between the Barrio and Watts. So in a, in a summer, I got to see, you know, some pretty, pretty, forget the blood and gore aspect of it, the human, the human condition 
uh, was really impacting to me. And a doctor said, Oscar, you kind of care too much about these patients. And if you're going to do that, you're going to go crazy as a doctor. So yeah. shifted from being a doctor. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll go to law school instead. But in the interim, covering my bases, let me get into the business school and get a business degree. So at least I have a backup. Uh, I was right. always doing all that. So, um, I, I, so I was going to go to law school. I got accepted to a few. I uh, went back to Georgetown. I spent uh, October, November, December, probably three and a half, four months. Uh, I had a little money on scholarship. I had no money to place to stay. I was kind of a poor kid. And, um, and so it, it was quickly working out that I wasn't going to be able to do what I did undergrad was beg, borrow, not steal uh, right. <laughs> from everyone. So I, I, so I said, hey, listen, why don't I defer my entrance for the following uh, um, year and I'm going to go back, get a job, work for a year, make some money so I can actually like, you know, get my own place and buy my own books. Right. Uh, and so I went back and I got a job a few weeks later and I started working at PepsiCo uh, as a financial analyst. And that's the financial degree that took me down that path. Uh, a little happenstance, but uh, it worked out okay for me. Uh, so we did a lot of finance stuff at Pepsi, then at Coke, and then uh, went into a, a you know, sort of telecom and, 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 and uh, all in finance and strategy, all the while learning more about technology and procurement and all the other sort of surrounding parts. Worked with a lot of lawyers over the course of time and doing all of that stuff. Went through a lot of big deals, dramatic deals, uh, CEOs being, um, you know, indicted for various things, proxy battles. I mean, just the whole gamut of things. And then invariably uh, jumping to a public company CFO role that opened up for a, a little known company at the time and in a little known industry, which was railroads. And I went there on the sole premise of. Uh, financially oriented, it, I, I saw a lot of value there and versus going to some other place. I had another job at a big financial institution that was going to be much more prominent, but I saw an opportunity here. And again, I always say proof, not promise. We took sure. what was a roughly seven billion market cap company. This is CSX, the railroad company yep. in Jacksonville, Florida, went from uh, that seven billion market cap and Took it as high as 70 billion at one point in time. So my instinct about what we could do there and make value was good. And I also learned a ton from a great team there. And so yeah. that was kind of my finance world. That's awesome. So how did you end up getting involved with United? So when I first uh, took the uh, public company CFO role, my first uh, was uh, early 40s. Uh, and uh, uh, one of our bankers uh, knew the Continental United folks they were looking for a financial expert on their board that had some transportation background. I was a fairly new minted CFO and in the transportation industry, but freshly minted. So I went and met with them. So I joined the board uh, of Continental Airlines and was there uh, until they merged with United. And so that was the initial connection to the airline industry, which at the time, uh, just from a valuation aspect, of the market cap of CSX by itself was twice as large as all of the airlines in the United States combined market. Wow. Yeah, that was a, wow. the significance. And, and, and again, it just, I always made fun of it in the sense that going to airline board meetings always made me feel better about my business every day because <laughs> we were in such a different level of financial position. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And having that perspective of coming into also a regulated, a railroads regulated industry as well, right? Yeah, and I did that. I had the telecom space was yep. heavily, heavily re re uh, regulated, and so uh, and of course telecom was as well. So I, I'm no, I was no stranger to unions. I was no stranger to governmental sort of regulation, compliance, uh, and all the rules accordingly. And so I learned from a very early stage to really rely and understand the concept of compliance and uh, rely on wonderful counsel that was helpful along the way, uh, rather than just. Doctor knows, which we'll talk about. I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. So, so you're you're on the board of Continental United, right? The merger documents said, and and all the legal structure had effectively been put in place uh, while you were on the board, or just before you had joined. Is that right? Uh no. We were okay. a standalone company, and I was probably one of the two prominent board uh, prominent people on the board. Okay. that uh, that really pushed for the consolidation. Again, in my world, having seen a lot of consolidation, and it's, you know, a, a simple analog, musical chairs. Invariably, when an industry is consolidating, 
yeah. um, you quickly are going to be left as the one without the chair. And United uh, Continental, as good as it was, was a relatively small regional player with a hub in uh, in Houston, of course, and uh, New Jersey, and then uh, a little bit of one in Cleveland. So that was the extent of their their footprint. And uh, with other people beginning to consolidate around that, it was important that we. So no, so I was a big push to get that done, a big part of the process, and then of course the inevitable uh, integration that always has a lot of difficulty. Yeah, so let's let's talk about let's talk about that integration and let's talk about how they convinced you to get off of the board and come in and be an operator. Oh gosh, you know um, <laughs> <laughs> that's I always feel it's just so much. The reason I wrote a book is it has a lot of this stuff in there and right. in a wonderful order where you can pay attention because it's hard. So. Um, the the board seat was wonderful for me. We were, you know, it was it was great as an operator um, to be part of that board. Understand the difficulties of integration. Understand the difficulties that we were going through and taking two very proud heritages and trying to bring them together. Uh, and importantly, there was also a beginning to um, I don't know. There was a lot of uh, the, the company was becoming a quickly a mess. The Continental side. Uh, okay. So I'm on the board. I chair the finance committee. And audit committee, and I'm getting involved in comp, and you know the board is very busy because we've got uh, investor dissent, we've got customer issues, we got you know our, the complaints were piling up, and we got you know back to regulation, and DOT is very concerned. So all in all, it was not a great place. Uh, the person that we had as head of the company was himself a lawyer, a very bright, very very intelligent and capable lawyer. But uh, a lot of the business side wasn't really happening. So, um, right. what uh, you know, how I came to be the CEO is is a, a, a kind of a long story. But I'll just uh, preface it with simply: uh, there was a situation where, because of my involvement, the board members felt that I could be a suitable leader. But I was on my other company. I was six weeks from being. Uh, announced as the CEO of that company. I'd gone from CFO to pres the COO and then president, and I was just about to be announced to be the CEO there. So, you know, the one in the hand kind of uh, concept. Right. So yeah. again, there's, I, I don't, it sounds like I'm pushing the book, but you want to hear about this. Because yeah. we all, the, the, the important part of why I wrote it in the book, all of us go or will go through that conversation and decision about whether to do something else versus what you're doing now. How do you go about making that decision? And I talk a lot about those things. And the most important point there, by the way, is really, truly, realistically, not BS, not what you want to think. You have to know who you are. Know thyself is my term for it. Because what drives you? What motivates you? Is it adulation? Is it compensation? Is it role? Is it title? Or is it creating that? Oh, there's a whole, all or none are right or wrong, but you have to know yourself better before you make big lifetime decisions from you. So I'm on the board and uh, they call and say, hey, would you be interested? I said, no, I got this gig and I'm about to be CEO. I built this and have I explained the difference in margins and market cap and value between right. that and this? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then uh, the situation grew a little bit more dire. And by the way, the situation has a legal aspect involved, which you know maybe we'll talk about. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there was uh, there was just an ongoing process of determining what was going to happen. It was an investigation into my the, my predecessor, which eventually led to his uh, removal and and my arrival. And the process to get there was a long and winding road. But fundamentally, for me. Um, I, it was just, uh, you know, I had helped my company, CSX, turn around and get those kind of things. I was part of the team and it was great. So two things came to mind is I, I thought I had another turnaround in me, A, and B, one that would be my own, right? Because part of the team is wonderful, but also, you know, going to do that. So those are the combination of two things. And then lastly, in this concept of knowing myself, I know I've learned in my tenure in life um, of the things that I do better than better than others and bridging people or unions were a mess. Uh, yeah. Communicating with frontline was something I did. Um, so communicating with investors about the, the future was something I was able to do. So I had all those skills that I thought would be more applicable and useful on the United side rather than continuing what would have been a, a much easier, certainly, road on CSX. 
and uh, that's the reason I went to as concisely as I can put it. Sorry. No, that that makes a ton of sense. And being able to put your put your fingerprints truly across the whole organization is is a really critical thing. I know, you know, I've I've spent my career in startups and being able to have that uh, that opportunity to to do the growth, to do the change again, and to have an increasingly um, uh, an increasingly meaningful impact on that direction is something that, at least for me personally, is a big driver for everything that I do. No, and again, uh, again, just to paraphrase, you know who you are, you know what you like to do. That's what's made your decision to leave big companies and do what you do. And and so that's an important thing for all of us to, to do that because of our knowing ourselves and what we like. Because as you know, uh, and I, I have a VC, so I deal with a lot of startup founders. Yeah. It ain't easy. It is a lot of yeah. work. It is a lot of ringing of but you know, and there's no one else around you usually in the case. Yeah. Big, so and that's where you have to really know yourself. Are you up for that sort of thing? It's do you want to be a salesperson or do you want to be a finance person early in your careers? I mean, we right. we have a sense, or do you want to be a lawyer, which apparently all of you have decided to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good so, thing. Yeah, sometimes it is. Uh, it's interesting. I've been trying to get away from being a lawyer for a little while here, so. Uh, oh, and I just dragged yeah. and I just dragged you back in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So uh, the situation that you stepped into uh, as CEO, I mean, obviously, uh, I had mentioned the the heart attack that you had thirty days in, or just over thirty days in. What uh, what were you walking into? And can you tell a little bit of that story? Sure. Um, I, I alluded to earlier. It was a mess across all all our constituencies. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, one of the leadership lessons that I, I tend to talk about is, you know, when leading a turnaround or, or, or walking into a troubled situation, it could be a department, it could be, you know, the office of the general counsel in a company or job you take, uh, or any of those sorts of things, um, I have found that the most important thing is to figure out what you're going to fix first. Because if it's troubled or requires a turnaround, there's a lot of things that are broken. And you'll get lots of different input from different people, people that are hiring you. Um, and oftentimes uh, learning what that, what the, you need a platform where if you get that one generally right, all the other things that we can, you know, that, that you're going to do have to be built on that foundation. So if you're going to build a car, right, I mean, you know, you're going to need, I don't know, make it up this, the, you need tires before the engine can move. So how do you, how do you sort of sequence all of these things? Um, and so uh, I walked into a company that it's funny because I've been on the board and I had a sense because we had all the external issues. I didn't have a sense of the depth of what I called uh, on my first Wall Street Journal article as it, you know, the disenfranchise, my disengage and disillusionment, the big three D's of of the company itself, the employees, the people that serve you your coffee, get you your ticket, fly you safely, handle your bags how completely disassociated they've become with the company. Why is that? A bunch of different reasons. Um, eight CEOs in the previous decade might be a reason, right? Yeah. Left, right. Uh, the union battles that were waging in a very, very violent and vitriolic way, for sure, was driving a divide. And uh, and also, um, simply, you know, the leadership that was there before, uh, didn't exhibit a level of caring for the employees that you wanted your employees to do for your customers. And right. there's that old adage, right? Treat your employees like you want your customers. Your customers. We, we hear all these things from, you know, that everybody writes books and, and all that. It's rare as a leader that you actually apply any of those in a meaningful fashion where it makes a difference. So my approach was simply that with all this input, with all these things broken, what's the platform that I need to start with? And the only way to do that was to listen and learn before you lead, which is another one of my axioms that I use because it's just simple to do those things. And and, and so everybody goes, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's like, well, no, it doesn't. This concept of listening and truly learning is a human trait that requires very genuine, very transparent conversations that builds a trust that then creates into an actionable sort of thing. And so it's not quite as easy as it sounds. Um, and certainly when you uh, talk about it loud, it's like, no, what are you gonna do next? Says Wall Street or says, and it's like, you know, I, I, I mean, and all of you will appreciate that have supported 
uh, CFOs and CEOs and earnings calls, um, my answer to that question is, what do I know? It's like, you know what? I don't know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to go listen and learn from a lot of people. And those people are the people that run the business day to day because they're the ones that have lived through this, you know, these eight CEOs. And so that was met with, uh, well, a thud pretty much because that's like, what the hell? Is, you, know, you know, the street wants you to cut people and of course. shut stuff down and, you know, that kind of thing, uh, actionable things that go on the spreadsheet. Uh, but this is, again, an adage that I apply to all functions in an organization. Uh, it's not just about the technical learning. It's not about the, the law specifically. It's like, how do you apply it to the situation that you have? And how do you apply it in a way that's going to make meaningful difference? And importantly, how do you support someone like SEO who, with conviction that indeed that's something you want to be able to go, uh, that, that you can and, and should do? And so uh, when I said those words, of course, the stock drops and you know, people get a little concerned. What does that mean? Right. But it was an important part of the initial phase of United's turnaround is getting those people that were disillusioned, disengaged, and disenfranchised sort of back on the airplane and heading in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't imagine having to do that uh, for a public company, especially especially with the amount of attention that airlines get um, uh, in you know in the media and at at a time when sort of that financial news media monster was really starting to roar, just given what was happening with the economy at the time and all of that. Um, yeah, I, I would not want to be doing that type of a turnaround in that public of a way. Yeah, there are some interest, there are some companies and industries where everybody has a very strong opinion about every part of it. And, you know, an airline is that way because, you know, pretty much everybody flies. And, uh, and so there are going to have viewpoints and it's a complicated business. It's difficult. It's relatively low margin compared to other things, but there's not going to, and it's heavily, heavily competitive as well. So, but that's what, so it's what makes it wonderful to work too. Oh, by the way, the size and scope, I mean, I had, you know, close to a hundred thousand employees operating in 70 different countries. Um, and all of you can appreciate the compliance the various regulatory, the DOJ, you know, it's, it's all the things that, you know, the interaction with government officials, you know, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or, you know, there's there's nation states out there where, you know, everything's a barter. You know, it's like, hey, you want yeah. your flight's coming, you want a gate? Well, give me something for that gate and all those things that have to be managed and controlled. So it's fascinating. It really is kind of fun. Yeah, there, there's there's so many ins and outs around it. It's It's got to be just an incredibly an incredibly large Rubik's cube that you're just sitting there twisting the whole time. With, um, color, with changing with changing colors, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, there's a time frame. <laughs> the yellow turns to red if you don't put it in the right place initially. So that's right. <laughs> so just over a month in, major major personal life situation, professional life situation. Um, to the extent you're comfortable, would love to hear you talk a little bit about that. So coming coming right out of that, it seems like within um, within a much shorter time frame, uh, you were able to resolve a lot of the labor disputes. You were able to really get the company moving forward. Um, would would love to hear that story. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I'll involve a PSA here for all of you because I think it's. I mean, it's a. It's important for I think for some of us to hear, all of us to hear this. Uh, so you know, the it was 37 days into my new role that I suffered a pretty damn near fatal heart attack with no pre-existing condition. I was a uh, I, you know I had just I had just raced in a, in a hundred mile bike race two weeks before, finished in the top 10 percent of my age group. I was a vegan, uh, and so not necessarily what you would expect to have you know, from a heart attack aspect of that. And what you right. quickly learn is heart disease is a the largest killer in America by far. Yep. Two, its symptomatic nature is such and wide and varied that it's not like, oh my God, it's the big one or something. It's, there's so many different facets of blood flow that affect you know top and lower part of your body. So the symptoms are many and different. And uh, see, because of that, very few people understand that they are indeed having a cardiac condition. And uh, most of us will say, oh, you know, I don't feel great. I'm going to sit down or I'm going to lay down or maybe a quick shower or that, those sorts of things. So here's the dramatic piece. If you do any of those things other than do what I'm going to tell you, you know, the possibility of you passing is very high. That's why okay. people die. 
they do not understand or respond to the symptoms that are in front of them. Um, and so uh, I learned of the symptoms in a, in a way because as I was training for, I, I ran triathlons and marathons and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I, I have a doctor friend, he's a cardiologist, and he'd always, always, always tell us, hey, listen, some of the, some of the people that die on my operating team are relatively young and fit. And yeah. they die so because they don't follow the symptoms and do something about it. So his admonition was simple to all of us. He says, if you ever feel anything weird, he used the term weird, and we all know our bodies to some degree. We know normal aches and pains of working out or doing something, but weird, weird is certainly something different, right? And so he says, if you ever feel anything weird, he said, immediately call 911 um, and, and tell them where you are, which, okay, um, you know, that makes logical sense. But the tell them where you are also was seen kind of, but he added a pretty dramatic piece that I, that's what I remember most vividly and what I'll share with you. He goes, call 911 and really tell them where you are is because you may not make it past the phone call. And I remember exactly where I was and I saw him like, okay, his name is Mario. He's like, Mario, that's a little dramatic, right? Like, oh, right. oh tell them where. Um, but, you know, for me, fast forward uh, a couple of years, 37 days into my job, I've been out listening and learning from people, all the things we talked about before, what I found in the company, uh, getting a lot of listening and learning and engaging. And, uh, it, you know, as I would soon learn, creating quite the connection with a lot of those employees because, you know, it's this amazing thing about human caring and genuine transparency and building trust that bonds you to another human. We all know that in our personal relationships, but we rarely do it in the finance. Um, so, um, you know, with regards to, to my situation, when I had this event, I immediately, uh, you know, I, I, I called 911 and uh, they came and, uh, and again, it's crazy, crazy aspects of, of, of truthful, miracle sort of situations. So 37 days into the job, 37 minutes from when I called 911, I was on what something's called ECMO, which is an uh, uh, artificial heart-lung machine, uh, and, and uh, I was on a medically-induced coma. And so wow. the, the, the time involved in calling 911 for me was, was really pronounced. Had I not had that background and that admonition from my friend, uh, I would have probably, you know, sat down. I mean, my symptoms were my phone buzzed across the across the way, and I went to walk to get it, and my legs kind of felt wobbly. I just come back from a run; it wasn't a long run, so it wasn't that. And I, you know, I remember thinking, no. Oh. And then I took two more steps, and my legs sort of gave out. And as I sat on my knees, I was a little clammy. And his words, the words I've just shared, the story came flushing back to me, yeah. and I immediately, you know, scrambled for my. Uh, it's called a landline. Some of you may have heard about that. Uh, I know. I, I know. I've read about it. All day. I've seen um, it in museums. Right. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, um, you know, in a whole string of miracles, uh, the EMTs were just coming back from another call. They just literally happened to be turning the corner in my building in Chicago because I told them where I was, was on the 50th floor of my of my building. So finding them, uh, finding me was going to be difficult. My door was locked, so I scrambled to the door. Uh, got put on life support and uh, some funny stories out of, out, of, out of all of that situation. But at the same time, time was of the essence. And so I share all of that with you in the case that indeed uh, you ever feel that way or you know someone or you know people that might have a heart condition or frankly, that, whatever you're having drinks or dinner with people over the holidays. Hey, I heard this crazy guy talk about this. Look at this story. You have no idea. And I do not exaggerate or dramatize this. We have thousands of notes and I get more than several personal sort of people stop me in a terminal on an aircraft to tell me that they heard this story and they told their mom or their loved one or to themselves. I've had grown men and literally in tears. So this, I was riding on my bike and I felt something. I stopped. I remembered your story. So um, this indeed, again, without being overly dramatic, can save someone's life. And it's so simple, right? Just call 911. I mean, the worst you can be is embarrassed that it's indigestion or something so so that whole story strung out i uh, i was i took a little health little health break from work for a couple yeah. of months had a heart transplant um a couple of months later and i was out of the hospital in seven days uh out on a thursday and then back to work on a monday which is the wonderfulness <laughs> of medical you know technology and medication nowadays and here i am today that's incredible that's that's an unbelievable story unbelievable yeah, it is pretty crazy. So. 
Um, That's so, the short version, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as far as, and, and it's obviously really difficult to transition from that to now go talking about, you know, a little bit more, a uh, little bit more of the sort of lawyer type stuff. Obviously, you were dealing with a ton of lawyers. You said that there was an investigation that was going on when you when you took over with some of the prior management uh, involved. Um, you spent a ton of time around lawyers. Um, what maybe if you can give give some perspective on um, some of the doctor knows and how you treated that and managed to navigate around some of that and uh, and some of the more positive uh, lawyers that you worked with. Yeah, uh, maybe let's start with the positive side because the Dr. No thing, I think everyone understands and comprehends sure. that. I'll reinforce it by uh, by providing an example of how bad it can go on a couple of different situations, honestly. Sure. Uh, the good is, you know, I, I believe strongly through my tenure that uh, all the people on your executive team, if you're a CEO, of course, are important. Uh, and they're important functionally, you know, the revenue person, the finance person, all the different folks, the operations person, certainly, in an airline. But when the proverbial stuff hits the fan, there needs to be somebody that goes beyond their functional capability and is able to uh, understand you, understand your soul, understand you know what makes you be, what, what trepidations you have, what deficiencies you might have in your thinking, what biases, you know, that whole gamut of, of human decision making that that someone when pushed into a flight or life life flight or, or fight kind of situation, sorry, um, uh, can happen. And you have to build that relationship well ahead of that situation. So all of you that work with people on your own companies, I mean, you, you it is imperative uh, that you understand your clients so that you can keep them out of their own way is what the issue is. Because again, uh, my instincts uh, are my instincts unless somebody steps right in the way. So build that relationship. I've had, gosh, you know, back at CSX, you know, in the conversation, we had an incredibly tough, incredibly intelligent woman who uh, was always sort of course correcting and being the person that shone the light on what the right thing was to do. Um, I'll leave an example of one of the things that we did, and I was chief operations officer at the time, and and being ready in, in the contingencies, if anything of catastrophic nature would happen, the preparation, not just of how you're going to fix your assets and your structure, but how you're going to impact and alleviate the concerns and impact on the community that you just disrupted in a big way. Right? We had a we had a situation just a few last year with one of the large railroad companies that yeah. that derailed and caused a lot of concern in East Palestine. Um, yep. The response there was not considered to be positive. At CSX, I can tell you the structure we had for response, led by our chief counsel, was almost cumbersome and and expensive in an operating people's uh, world mind. But when the right. stuff hits the fan, first thing we did is we had people in the air, we had people on the ground, we had a tent or a building and, and money flowed to that community immediately. Like there's yeah. no no questions, you know, and and so that's the way you alleviate the immediate concern. And so the, the, the phrase I learned from someone like that was frankly, um, you know, if, if we've broken it, we fix it. And, right. and there, nothing else matters. And that came from a general counsel. So that's an example of one really good. The other one has to be my general counsel at United. When I went out with my heart condition, uh, he stepped up to be interim CEO, which is a big step to do. You know, from the, he yeah. was a relatively new to the company as well. And you know, we, you mentioned Flight 3411, which I'm sure we'll talk about to some degree, uh, which was the dragging of that customer from our flight. All of you saw it. I know you did. So. Yeah. Um, uh, I say to this day, because he knows me and knew me at the time, and he was on vacation that morning. Okay. And all the stuff that went down on that flight literally happened in the first couple of hours. Right. All the damage was done like that. And yep. I know for a fact, if he had been in the room and with us, it wouldn't have happened. It moved that quickly. And I'm a smart person. I know how to respond to things. But again, so much information was coming from so many different places. 
and there was legal counsel uh, to do this or not do that. And we could talk about that later, but all of that came into be that led uh, to that situation where had he been in place and when he, so those are the, those are the good things. A quick bad situation, I probably dealt with my, my, my predecessor at United. Again, a very intelligent lawyer that was dealing with the situation with a public official, um, yep. did not, as a lawyer, did not involve his in-house team. Uh, our head of federal relations was also a lawyer, and they figured between both of them, right, how can two small, smart lawyers go wrong? They initiated some practices and some events and initiatives that ended up blowing up in their face without any degree of awareness or knowledge on our in-house legal team. So you right. went your own way and went your uh, went that practice. So so there's just, you know, it's it's a really difficult role that en encompasses well beyond your technical legal capabilities for most of you. Uh, yes. And it delves into this human dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about here on Cockpit Council is that being a good lawyer in whatever your discipline is, is table stakes, but it doesn't make you a good in-house lawyer. What makes you a good in-house lawyer is understanding the business, building the relationships, really uh, living and embodying the values of your company and, and, and putting those things as forefront of your mind, as opposed to your legal analysis being what's at the forefront of your mind, right? With most, you know, with most extremely complicated legal issues, you can reach out to the, uh, gosh, nowadays, probably like $1,800 to $2,000 an hour partner if you need that level of expertise. And you go and you get it, but it's knowing whether you need that level of expertise that really is the value that you can provide. And you only know that if you really know the company, if you really know the business, and you really know what you're trying to do. And you really know, in my example, the human that's making the decision that's um, because that's, right. that's the you have to fight that instinct. So in the dragging of the customer, for instance, I, I think we've talked about my instinct is my alignment with the frontline folks yes. and the situation that United that there was no United employee involved in that. Yeah. None. It was there was the this and this and all that stuff. So my instinct was to protect and support my people, which in the broader scheme of things, right? Wait a second, this piece of crap is. Just beat the you know and the you know the, yeah. the the visuals and action and the actions were so divergent that you know Bret Hart is his name would have not let me do that. It's like I hear you. This is not the time to do that. This is what you need to get done. And and right. I would have you know I would have listened. I mean, it's a natural instinct though. You like when you really do connect with your staff and and you have a you build a level of trust and a level of relationship. These are these are your teammates, and you stand behind your teammates. Um, you know, that, that should be the first instinct for, for really anybody. Right. And, the, and the doctor no situation is, you know, the downside of that is people avoid you, as in my example, right? It's like right. the two lawyers involved probably knew that if they went, you know, real lawyers, they would say, ah, uh, no. Uh, I, always, I, I always tell or operating folks or advise counsel, it's like, you know, it's a delicate balance between saying Mr. Yes or Mrs. Yes all the time and Dr. No kind of thing. And nobody's suggesting that you're this, you know, you're always in that uh, conciliatory mode. But at the same time, um, the, you have to get your clients to come to you and say, listen, here's what I want to do. Here's how I'm thinking about this. Here's the objective I want. And knowing that it's probably impossible, so, help me walk me through how I might do some of that or, or the, that. And that's, that's the kind of relationship that people are coming to you with those guys, like help me through this. Not, I want this or I want that because uh, what happens is that people always get second and third opinions and then you get into trouble. And so um, not an easy task. All of you will have your own way of doing these things, but it starts at least from this person's opinion is getting, gaining the trust of that decision-making that you have to stop from driving off a cliff because unfortunately as lay people we tend to do that and that's what you're guard you're the guardrail for all of us yeah exactly or or we're at least the people who after you've driven off the cliff try to figure out how to attach a parachute to the car right yeah which is you know the proverbial horse out of the barn i always get those things screwed up kind of thing right. uh, as in my situation was um you know it was right. just way too late and it happened so quickly is the point well, the other, the other thing too is 
once try and trying to make sure I say this the right way. Um, the media can be an absolute beast and the media makes, makes the story, whatever they want it to be, regardless of the reality. At least that, you know, that was largely my experience with it. I think many others, uh, have had the same experience, um, where it's really not an interesting story that the company did the right thing. Right. No one, no Mm -hmm. one, no one's going to click on that. Right. Um, so, you know, you're, you're dealing with, what may be actually the right thing, but it's not the right story that the media wants to tell. And so now you have, you have something completely different that you're trying to clean up. And it's, you know, it's not like you can just go and put something out. It's like turning around a cruise ship and it takes time and it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. But importantly, I mean, to your point of this parachute on the falling car, um, it, 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 you know, I'll always go by that. It is never too late to do the right thing. And then it may not have the impact. It may not erase the issue, but you know, it's there's just nothing worse, right? It's never the act, but the cover up, all those those aspects. And I have learned uh, all of those instances by personal and painful experience. And uh, uh, it, it's just, you know, it's, uh, it, this world has changed. And we can blame the media, we can blame the hype, we can blame sure. it, whatever. It's the world you live in. It's the role you signed up for. Get your collective stuff together. Get your team. Get the right corporate councils and other people around you to make sure that you manage this as best as possible. Because once the proverbial genie's out of the bottle, oh, that's my fourth silly analogy. <laughs> um, uh, it's, you know, it, it's difficult and it, it, it's an uphill battle after that. And of course you can recover from it, but your job is to help us from getting there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It'd be interesting to hear more about your relationship with the general counsel at United and how you guys built that trust. Um, and also how you work together to bring alignment to United as well. Yeah. Um, part of it is, is, you know, you have to have the right human beings um, that are just engaged and both sides have to be aware of that. I, I don't say this as a badge of, um, of honor and I don't mean this in a jerk way. Uh, and I sit on many organizations, I'll sit on boards and um, almost I would say 90% of the things that I've done after my role at United and the organizations and entities that I've had, um, I would say we, we've had about a turnover of that high a percentage of general counsels because of all the stuff I'm just telling you. It just wasn't there. And it's it not because the individual on we said was deficient or this, this just has to be, you know, kind of a, a chemistry and a desire to do that. And again, intelligence and pedigree and all of that. It, you know, it can work against you and it takes a lot. And I've had to work with certain people to really kind of beat it into their heads. It's like, I don't care how smart you are. It doesn't matter. The person that has to take the ownership for this is the person you support. And, you know, and, and so you have to go. So we've made a, a lot of changes. That's how important I think this is, that changes have been made um, like to, to a degree at, at my urging uh, because it is such a critical thing. You know, with me and, and Brad, um, it was a function of, We went through an investigation of a CEO when I was on the board. The first call he made to the chair of the audit committee, which was me, is to say, hey, this happened. And he explained it in the wonderful way that lawyers can. And 45 minutes later, when he took a break, (laughs) my only comment is like, not not prescient at all from my perspective. I said, we're going to need a new CEO. And and he stayed quiet because that's not his place to find. But that that entire investigation process, the way it was handled, the way my uh, recruitment, if you will, uh, so if we built it up, you know, it's you know, fire forges steel. Fine, yeah. <laughs> going for a count here. <laughs> um, and the um, uh, was that, and then of course uh, he, him having to step up and be an interim CEO while I went out interact with my family about the private nature yet the public nature of all of that and managing and governing all the you know there's a board we had we had uh, we had a proxy battle beginning to you know to start and so there was all sorts of commotion uh, trying to hold all that together uh was something in the way um that he was able to do it uh manage the board created this level of not only capability but um sort of a depth of understanding of the human angle for it not just 
not just, you know, well, this is what we have to do. We have to say this, we have to say that. There was an understanding and, and I appreciated the way, you know, sort of my angle of things. So, so yeah, so it's just that level of personal relationship. And again, he and I didn't know each other, but for all of those activities. Uh, but then when it became so personal with my health issues and then with a the proxy. And so, you know, again, it was a relationship forged on a lot of situations going on and us working very well together. And again, his demeanor being perfect for me. Because, you know, he'd always come in and he'd let me go off about whatever I was going to go off about. <laughs> and he would say, no, okay, that's great. And, so, and then he would just gently say, no, so there's, you know, the one thing you have to consider is this or this. And I'm like, ah, that's right. It's like, no, I can't do that. <laughs> um, and so that's, that was my experience. And I, now that takes time to build and it takes both sides to do it. So you ask for an example and that's the one I had with and continue to have to this day with that person, who's now the president of our company, by the way. Being able to build that trust is absolutely critical. What what sort of advice do you have for a lot of for a lot of attorneys coming into their first, you know, chief legal role? Um, there's a bit of a I'm going to do what my predecessor did or I'm going to do what my mentors mentors told me to do um, from from your perspective as a CEO, what would you want to see from that that legal leader to actually show a desire to build that relationship and build that trust? I, I Simply put, and it's difficult for many of you because of the advanced and competitive training and education and all the stuff that you had to do to get to where you are, to get to the school that you wanted, to finish wherever you did in your class. That's right. It's, never, it's always been this competitive aspect. So, yeah, we get it. You're smart. You're really smart. Uh, but when you try to prove to everyone in the room how much smarter you are than anyone else, that is the first human disconnect that just pisses people off. You yeah. just completely begin to alienate people. Um, the way you treat your staff, other lawyers, and you come from, you know, if you come from a firm where you've worked, you know, you build 180 hours per day. I know that's impossible, yeah. but it feels like that. Um, and, and, and that environment and culture, um, how you assimilate into the new place, how you understand the humans that you're now, you know, in charge of helping and assisting, not just the senior person, but the people, if you're in a department, right? Who's your functional head? Um, I always urge, get in on their weekly or whenever staff meetings are there, you become part of that team. You, If you're not the general counsel, and you're somebody, you, you, you know, you report to the general counsel, but you're in charge of the head of the operations or, what, or, or revenue, you know, get as deeply involved and be a trusted source and advisor, certainly a voice that says, hey, no, we, you know, it's like, before we go any further, you know, you have to do all of those work. And then when crises come, you know, developing that relationship, that comes about not because you're the smartest thing. And I know we read a lot of books about really smart lawyers that have advised and counseled presidents and all this. Uh, in, a, in the real world that most of us live in, inside of companies, uh, your, the level of trust uh, that you develop with people around you, I think is 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 proportional to your personal success uh, because people will come to you. Um, and so yeah. uh, I have a phrase, you know, if you go all in, if you walk into something all asses and elbows, right? Like, hey, I'm smart, I'm here, you guys are stupid, and that's why none of you got promoted to this role, and that's why you're all in trouble over here in the functional area or in the company. Um, it's an approach. Uh, it is, I don't think, a durable one. And it's not durable because it doesn't permeate into the thoughts of people in the organization that learn to do the right thing because they know it's the right thing and they know why it is. Right? You just can't tell. You can command people all you want. It, it's a big leadership thing for me. It's like you have a huge organization. You know, you stand at the pulpit and say, we're going to be more efficient and productive and all of these things. And most of the people are like, I don't hear anything. I just hear noise. How do you how do you get that durable permeating effect that people do the right things on ethics, on compliance, on that? Because they know it's the right thing to do, as opposed to it's just something you have to do. 
Um, and this, you know, if, if, this goes across areas. I mean, probably cybersecurity folks are kind of in that stage now. They're all like, well, the board said I have to do this. And so they're out marching around making people do things that people don't understand. So guess yeah. what that happens? They don't do it. That's the yeah. whole thing. So there's a function of, of just practical reality that you say, you can say you did and said all the right things. It, unless it actually happened and it averted any kind of problematic thing, you ain't done your job. So. Yeah. It's a great answer. Um, and how has your perspective changed now that you're sitting on a bunch of boards as opposed to being the CEO? Um, it's kind of like being a grandparent. <laughs> <laughs> hey, your kid's acting up. See ya. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, there is a little bit of freedom in that. Um, what doesn't change? You, well, you heard my mantra on general counsels and the relationship with the CEO of a corporation, how important that has to be. And if I see a flaw in it, I jump right in. I just say, listen, you know, today, day to day, it's going to work, but over time, are you really, you know, I'll point both of them, though, you usually come to a decision. Uh, so that has not changed. Uh, none of the things I've said, talk, you know, I think what, what changes when you when you step away from being the decision maker to some degree is how to gently advise and counsel and suggest rather than prescribe. Um, and I see that with a lot of retired CEOs. Uh, you know, they walk into a boardroom and, you know, they the long said, well, you know, when I was running XY company, here's what I did and this and this. And, and uh, that tends to, uh, you know, sort of, it, it becomes, it, it tends to irritate both management and that, because it's like, why is that applicable to my situation here? Um, and so what what I, I, I think I do, I'm sure I, I fail at times, is to, again, this concept of listen and learn before leading is a really important one. It's like, why are we trying to do that? What are the, you know, all that. And so it takes a little more time to get some of that stuff done, but I try to approach it. Um, and, and then what, what mostly has changed is you realize that you are not, you are not the final decision maker and how important it is to get, um, you know, uh, unanimity inside the boardroom to build an intentional culture about how we approach things. And I think more importantly, because of all the stuff that I've been through um, is to rather than have to have a long soliloquy about it, so that people understand, like, you know, experience matters in all these things. Right. You know, I have a situation in one of my companies now that's really gotten out of proportion. And my first day was like, we should talk. And they went and did some things, and now they're calling me like, "Yeah, we should have talked then." So, um, what changes is your uh, the perspective, uh, you know. But what can't change is how you uh, how you provide people your your experience and therefore suggestive things. It's amazing how when you've been through it, the a, not only your clarity but your believability and people wanting to listen is so much higher. It's like, yeah, yeah, he's been through this crap. Let's, let's think of it. And it's never, for me, it's never about this is what I would do. It's like, this is my situation. This is what happened. How is that applicable in this environment? Um, so proxy battles, crises, I mean, all sorts of things. Uh, succession, oh, <laughs> no shortage of things you learn. Well, it sounds like, it sounds like being able to bring that perspective of, of, uh, of being able to being able to manage the situation using a similar line of thought, as opposed to deciding on the same actions that perhaps you had taken, right? It's more like if I, you know, I went through this before, here's how I would be thinking about it. Not this is the decision I would make because that's the decision I made last time. Right, right. right. And uh, yeah, and yeah, no, I'll, I will say it. And very much to like the sort of advice or suggestions I make to all of you is, as in-house counsel, uh, by, by the most part, it's trying to get the board inside executive sessions to again align on common thematics, common points of view. There's nothing worse as a CEO than meeting with your head of, you know, your chair or your lead director, and it and it's like this array of things. It's like, well, you know, we had a good meeting, but and then you know, you know, all this, this and you have 17 things that. You know, a board member wants or this part. It's like you're like you walk away. Like I don't, I don't know how to fix all those. How do you, right. you know communication, action, uh, alignment, uh, complying? All of that is such a function of people. It's just understanding what's asked of them and why, and then you don't have to do a lot of really difficult work to convince them. But if you get everybody aligned, uh, they'll do that. What is the most important thing we want to say to this person? I say in a boardroom, and let's do that one or two things, 
That way they know what the, what the marching order is. And that applies to the things that you do on the legal side because there's such complexity, right? There's that old, what, KISS principle? Keep it simple, yeah. stupid, or tell yep. them what they need. Tell them what they need to know. Not everything you know, because I don't right. need your, you know, many years of legal training. It's like, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. It's like, was that a yes or a no? Right? You go off and do <laughs> And so, you know, operational people, especially, tend to be moving very quickly. We have yep. real life stuff, right? Planes are leading late. Some things that you know, it's a, it, it is that instant. So, I, it's hard for people that do the kind of things that at least I've done for like to sit there for a long period of time and watch you go through the sort of the, the rigors and, and tribulations of, of all the decision sort of outcomes that you can bet. It's like, I literally go, I don't know. It's like, yes or no. Um, and again, that's not fair, but just understand the other side of the equation there. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, we always end with some rapid fire questions. So if oh, you're boy. ready, I have some fun ones for you. <laughs> what I was are- trouble. I was getting in trouble with these. <laughs> good, no, you'll be good. Um, what are three characteristics of the best attorneys that you have worked with? Um, willing to share bad things with you. I don't know what, I don't know if it's a hmm. word there, but uh, uh, it's like, listen, they, they don't mix anything. So that, a, a genuine understanding of the broader agenda and a use of their vast intellectual talents for the good rather than their own self-promotion. Great. What is your hot take on working with in-house legal professionals? Uh, like everyone else, they are so crucial. There's so much work that you, but you guys know. There's so much stuff that gets done in those offices that nobody knows, but they keep us, it's kind of like uh, like my controller. You always stay close to your controller because that's that's your balance sheet and all that. So the hot take is a positive one. They're much needed. I've never looked at a, a legal department like, who are all these people and what do they do and why do you have so many of them across so many different angles? It's like because they keep you out of trouble. So find the ones that do that well and the hot take is always a positive one. Nice. What is your number one tip for somebody that is new to a leadership role? Uh, again, this listen and learn before you leave. I mean, just, you know, if you have a, an, you're taking over a department of, in, in part, in part of, a, of, of the council's department, just talk to everybody there. Just say, hey, Bill, hey, Mary, I'm, I'm new. You know, tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me what's going on. Get, get everyone's takes. Does two things. It, it obviously brings them into the fold. But two, you actually, if you create, if you do it in, in the right way, you're going to learn a lot more than you than you than you would, and quicker than any other one than than any other way you would. And then, of course, go talk to your clients. Like, mm. hey, what ails you about my department, my new department? And you'll, you put all that together, and then get the team together, and then figure out what your initiatives and objectives are around that uh, to support that organization. So that's the concept of listen, learn before you lead. Awesome. Thank you. So that was uh, it. Oh my God, those were easy. Those were like business <laughs> things. Like, what's your favorite color? And what's your <laughs> so uh, this one's even easier. Uh, last question we always uh, we always end with is talk about a charity or a cause that you're really passionate about, and where can our listeners go to support that cause? Sure. Um, you know, my latest, and it's an interesting one, given my heart transplant. There's a uh, an organization called Equity for Heart Transplant, and it's a small startup. Uh, what we've learned very quickly, what this group of mostly young heart surgeons have learned, that the decision to give a transplant to a human being is dependent on many variables. Certainly, the medical aspect is obvious in that, but there also seems to be like a biopsy of your wallet as well. And there's a lot of legislation in different parts of the country where, in effect, by, I don't know, intended or unintended consequence of those those rules that require you for everything else, you are ready for this transplant, which is a difficult place to get to. Uh, but now you have to show some financial ability that is, uh, it is difficult for people of underrepresented minorities or people in a, in a poor state. Like, you know, you need to have $5,000 in your bank account to be able to pay for expenses. Like, well, there's a lot of people in this country that don't have that. And many people, well, it's only $5,000. If that's your first instinct, you're wrong. You're so wrong. 
Yes. And so there are people. So this group of young surgeons is, you know, is in the rooms making the decision where people are being turned down for something like that. So they've begun an initiative to say, hey, listen, we can raise enough little money in our little place. We can provide that four or five thousand dollars in someone's bank account, or we can provide this amount for the medical. There's all these different things, and so uh, it's. I just think it's it's close to my heart because obviously I didn't face that sort of wallet biopsy that other people do. Um, but inevitably, we want to change laws. But in the interim, we want to raise enough money to help these people. And literally, I mean, it's checks like four. I think our average check size is seven thousand dollars. All the people that work in there are not paid. They all have meaningful, I mean, they're all doctors, so they're doing well, but they do this out of the goodness of their heart. Yeah. Uh, sort of thing. So, so equity for heart transplant. <clears throat> That's awesome. Oscar, thank you so much for taking the time. It's just been an incredible conversation. Um, really, really enjoyed uh, sharing, the, sharing the time with you here. Well, thank you. Congratulations on your success. Uh, in the, in, the, in the world of business and uh, only for doing things like this for your constituents because uh, it's always good to have wonderful conversations and thank you for making it so easy. Thanks. Take care, Oscar. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And if you liked what you saw, give us a like, subscribe, follow us on all the socials, and we will see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.